Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Meet, the series where we meet individual characters in our favorite video games, movies, popular culture, just in general. We try to break down their motivations and everything that makes them who they are. I have experience as an actor. I went to a classical school where we did a lot of exegetical analyses of characters. I like to do this stuff anyways, and I realize that a lot of you guys enjoy it as well, so I might as well turn it into videos. Because again, I would be doing it regardless, so I might as well publish it. If you're good at something, never do it for free. Before we jump into it, I should also stress that this is not going to be an exhaustive breakdown of the character's life story. It's not going to be a biography of Kratos as a character. Rather, we're breaking down key moments in their history. If you are interested in a full biography, I'll include a link to the wiki down below where you can find all sorts of information and read through every single bit of Kratos's life and lore to your heart's content. Also, I'm sure I'm gonna miss some beats and some individual things that you find important to the character of Kratos. We're primarily gonna be focusing on the most recent game because it's the most recent and most pertinent and includes the biggest character shifts and arcs. So as always, if you have something that I don't cover that you think is important, make sure to leave that down in the comment below and I'll try to read through them all as will many other viewers. And if it is something super significant, I'll create a follow-up video and give you credit. But with all that said, Let's meet Kratos. Kratos was born a demigod to a woman named Callisto after being fathered by Zeus. He grew up in Sparta where Callisto lived and as you would expect, had a very rough childhood as a result. Now, if you know anything about Zeus as well, you should know that this was not the first time he had gotten his dinky stinky and as you would expect, once again, Hera was upset that he had been messing around with another woman, specifically a mortal, and so she ordered Kratos' execution. But Zeus being the perpetual country Contrarian refused this request and allowed Kratos to continue growing up in Sparta with Callisto. Now, if you're not familiar with the way that Spartan children were raised, it's important to understand that they were raised in a very ruthless way. They were raised to be warriors through and through at any cost. Those who could not hold up to the rigorous training schedules and psychological torment that they would be put through were forced out of the community or simply outright killed. Now, part of what made this easier to manage was that Kratos was raised with a brother named Deimos. One of the little things that's important to understand about Deimos is that he was born with a really bizarre birthmark, which might not make a lot of sense right now, but it will in just a moment, I promise. Now, eventually Zeus, much like Herod in the Bible, found out that there was a prophecy wherein one of his sons were predicted to cause the fall of Mount Olympus and the demise of Zeus himself. And so, to avoid this, Zeus sent Ares, the god of war, and Athena to dispose of whichever son would overthrow him. Now, as I said, Zeus was a very busy individual, and so they weren't sure where to start or which son was responsible for this eventual overthrowing. However, one of the things within the prophecy was that the son that was going to be responsible had a very unique scar across his face. See what I mean about the scar being important? Well, now you see the big swap that's coming. But setting all that aside, after seeing the birthmark, Ares and Athena assumed that Deimos was the prophesied patricide practitioner, and so they invaded Sparta and took Deimos to Thanatos, the god of death. Now, Kratos tried to save his brother, but ultimately failed being a young man going up against the god of war, and he also received a permanent scar over his right eye thanks to Ares and a bit of wood. Now, Ares wanted to kill Kratos in this moment for standing up to him, but Athena stopped him. And so, when all was said and done, Kratos was still alive living in Sparta, growing up with a big scar over his right eye and no brother, and Deimos had been taken to the god of death, and at that point you can only assume what was going on. Now this really was the first seed of the hatred that was brewing within Kratos, this rage where he felt as though he was being mistreated and the, the cruelty of the gods over and above him was unparalleled and unmatched. He wanted to get revenge against them and that seed was planted very early on. However, as a child, Kratos obviously was incapable of exacting that revenge against the gods such as Ares and Athena and Zeus, the ones that he viewed as responsible for taking his brother from him. And so as a result, he spent the next few decades, at the very least, training his ass off to try to get strong enough to the point where he would be able to exact some sort of revenge. Not to mention that this was also just a part of life in Sparta. If you wanted to survive, you had to excel 
in fighting. And eventually Kratos worked his way all the way up to being a commander of the army and one of the greatest warriors, if not the greatest warrior in all of Sparta. During the course of all of this, Kratos married a girl named Lysandra and they had a daughter who will become very important later on. Now Kratos' daughter became very sick when she was young and as Spartan custom dictated, she was to be cast into a deep chasm to her death as a result of being unfit and impure, effectively being too weak to properly serve the state of Sparta. Basically, they viewed it as nature's do-over. If you get a gimp this time, you just roll the dice again, hope that the next kid you have is a little bit better. It is kind of sick when you think about it, but it was a very practical way of thinking. Kids were very, very expensive. They were hard to take care of, and a lot of them wouldn't even survive through childhood. So if they weren't strong to begin with, the odds of them making it all the way through childhood were fairly low, so they just figured, oh, that one's probably not going to work out. Let's just get rid of it and try again. It's very cold, but it's part of the reason that Sparta was able to survive for so long through so many centuries of fighting and war because they only allowed the best of the best genetically and physically to continue living within their ranks. Now, obviously, Kratos didn't want to lose yet another loved one, and so he set out on a journey for ambrosia, which is the food of the gods. He did this because he thought that if he was able to feed ambrosia to his daughter, she would heal and no longer need to be thrown off into a giant chasm. And I should also mention that at some point during this time period where he met Lysandra, had a daughter, became a well-respected warrior. Kratos commanded a bunch of soldiers underneath him, and one of them was known for his optimism and being able to see the light through the darkness at any given moment. He was somebody that Kratos really respected, and he thought that he was a bright spirit in a world of darkness, and it's going to be important later on but I'll leave it there for now. Now, Kratos fought in many battles during this time, and while he was fighting in one battle, he encountered his greatest challenger yet, somebody by the name of Alric the Barbarian, who was king of the East. During this battle, the Spartans began losing and Kratos became desperate. He eventually called out to Ares, the god of war, for help in exchange for his eternal allegiance. Ares accepted and killed all of the barbarians holding up his side of the bargain. And he also gave Kratos the Blades of Chaos as a sign of his servitude, which are also chained to Kratos' arms, a symbol of the slavery to Ares. Now, the obvious protestation to this particular plot point is that Kratos looked at Ares before this as the individual responsible for stealing his brother, for taking him to the god of death. Like, this is not somebody you would want to team up with. And there's two ways of looking at it, in my opinion. In the one hand, you can look at it as Kratos had just grown up and became much more pragmatic, looking at it as, yes, I, I hate Ares, but in this particular instance, it's either I ask him to help me or I'm going to die. It's just a matter of practicality. Either I kind of give over to this evil force as I see him and ask him for help or I die. And the other way of looking at it is that Kratos, as he grew up, eventually forgot about everything that happened with Ares and was able to sort of move on. I think both of these sides are supported in the lore. I don't know. Let me know your thoughts down below. Regardless, I think both of them could hold up if you were to look at it, although I think the former explains a lot more action of Kratos' actions as he goes through. He never liked the gods even when he became the servant of Ares, but he did it because he needed to, and that was the only way he was going to survive and be able to stay with his family. Now, Kratos served Ares for a while. Eventually, he went and raided a village of Athena's followers for Ares. And while Kratos was busy, Ares took Kratos' wife and daughter and placed them into the temple of Athena. And Kratos, being unaware of this, raged through the temple, killing everyone inside, including his wife and daughter. And the question, of course, is why would Ares do this? And he claimed that it was to sever all remaining ties that Kratos held to humanity, which would make him the ultimate warrior. And the question after this is whether or not this is true. Now, a lot of the story beats in God of War are fairly simplistic, and so one would hope that Ares, the God of War, would at least think through the steps of, okay, so Zeus 
saw this prophecy that this individual with a scar was going to overthrow everything. Mount Olympus, kill all of us, everything was going to collapse. And in his eyes, we already got the guy, we got Deimos. But this guy that now is in service to me, the god of war, has the same scar over his right eye. And he also is somebody who has a real temper and is one of the greatest warriors who's ever lived and I'm about to piss him off even more to an extent that we've never seen before. But this is one of those little things about the Greek gods that makes it a little easier to write these epic tales about them. And that is that they're not omnipotent or omniscient. They have weaknesses and they do have foresight that is not perfect. And so for Ares to think through these steps is not an end all be all. In fact, a lot of the Greek gods have a lot of short sightedness where they think through this very specific and small tunnel vision perspective. So they end up making a lot of mistakes and that allows for a lot of the big story and plot points that you see throughout all of the epic tales, including a tale such as God of War. It's one of the brilliant little tricks of Greek mythology, which is that the gods are reckless and and they tend to make a lot of mistakes simply because they are really, really full of themselves and incredibly arrogant. And so usually when one of these character choices that Ares or Zeus makes doesn't make a lot of sense, it can easily be explained by the arrogance of the gods, which is after all in and of itself a reflection of man and man's arrogance is a reflection of the gods. They go hand in hand, and it really is as old as these tales are. This idea of the reflection of man and god goes back thousands and thousands of years. So it's not something new to God of War in any way. Now, as you would expect, Kratos being disgusted by what he had just been tricked into doing, denounced his allegiance to Ares. Again, what did Ares expect to happen? and he decided to leave his family's bodies in the temple so that they could be burned. Now the oracle was also disgusted by Kratos' actions and cursed him to wear the ashes of his family's bodies on his skin for all eternity. And in case you weren't familiar, this is why Kratos has the sort of ashen skin throughout all of the games. He's actually covered in the ashes of his dead wife and daughter. If that's not morbid, I don't know what is. Not to mention, what a freaking tough thing to be faced with. Like, normally when something terrible happens or when you make a big mistake, you try to move on from it, forget about it physically. But with this, like, there's no forgetting that. They're literally on you 24-7 for the rest of all eternity. Even if you wanted to try to move on and get rid of it, you you wouldn't be able to. And this, I will say, is one thing that I don't think the writers and the designers within the God of War teams have really done a lot with, because it would make sense to me if Kratos was covered in the actual ashes of his family, if that's why he was so white and it was a constant reminder for him of the crimes that he'd committed, I would have expected some sort of plot point or story arc where Kratos is trying to cover himself up or only wears long clothes because he doesn't want to see it or be reminded. And then perhaps there's eventually a moment where he accepts the things that he's done and he doesn't have to cover up anymore because he's not rejecting what he's done. He's accepted it and it's part of who he is. But instead, they just always kind of left him out and about with huge rippling muscles. And uh, I, I get it, it's a video game, but I would have expected some sort of major plot point or character arc to be associated with this particular physical attribution. Now, after all of this, Kratos became a pariah and he was the worst of the entire world. Literally everyone knew who he was thanks to the white skin and the scars and he was branded as a family killer and traitor. And many allegedly would rather die than even be saved by him. They thought it would taint their souls if their souls were saved by this treacherous, disgusting individual. The knowledge of this treachery and the fact that he killed his family and was this horrible person was even so well known that Mimir, the little floating head on Kratos' waist throughout the entire game, 
He even is aware of this tale and story and knows who Kratos is just by the color of his skin and the scars that he has. The knowledge of Kratos' crimes and treachery and horrible actions traveled literally through the realms. Now over the next few years, Kratos killed the Furies. He eventually realized that Ares was responsible for all of this. He swears to kill all of the gods of Olympus that he previously served. And by the time that we reach the end of God of War III, Kratos has killed all of the gods of the Greek world. And it's also important to know that he killed Zeus, his father. And also an important side note is that as he kills Zeus, the chains fall from his arms. Once again, a symbol of his servitude and slavery to the gods of Olympus, eventually being lifted as he frees himself from their binds. And he also killed Athena. And after a long and convoluted mess, Kratos learns to forgive himself for killing his family and Athena with the help of Pandora's spirit. And as he stands on the top of Mount Olympus, realizing what he's done, he's asked by Athena to return her power to her so that she can fix everything that he's done, so that she can undo the chaos that Kratos has unleashed into the world. But Kratos, as you would understandably see, doesn't trust her. He refuses and instead impales himself with the blade of Olympus, releasing hope itself into the world, which implies at the very least, that it fixes everything. And the last thing we see is a post credit scene which shows a trail of blood going off the mountain, leaving Kratos' fate unknown. But what we do know is that he ushered in the end of that world. But emphasis on that world, the Greek world. Corey Barlog, the 2018 God of War games director, explained that he sees God of War as existing in a universe with many galaxies, wherein each galaxy is a different mythology. They all coexist, technically speaking, and are connected together, but they're also all separate. And this also makes it so that gods from one realm don't overreach and control other realms. Though this may very well happen later in the franchise, and that's actually one of my predictions, is that eventually we'll see gods from the Greek and Norse realm overlapping with gods of the uh, ancient Egyptian realm. And we even to an extent saw it in this most recent game where you see flashbacks to Athena, who of course is from the Greek realm, and you see her coming into the Norse realm, even if it is just in Kratos' mind, or if it is an actual apparition and spirit, it's not really clear, but we do know that it's possible for some overlap to exist. Perhaps the only reason that it doesn't happen more often is that each of the gods are perfectly satisfied and happy with controlling their own galaxy effectively. But this is where we were left off. God of War 3 launched in 2010, but the story wasn't advanced after this. We got some smaller spin-off titles with multiplayer, things like that, like God of War Ascension, but the story itself of Kratos wasn't advanced past this last moment where we see the blood trail running off the top of Mount Olympus. The story basically stood still. And this meant that a lot of fans of the series, myself included, were left wondering if Kratos actually did die or if they were gonna try to reboot it with a different character. We just didn't know. When I went back and played through God of War 3 again in preparation for the newest game releasing, I went back through it and I realized just how distant a character Kratos really is, how he doesn't stand out well, at least compared to modern day protagonists in games that we've gotten in the last five years or so. As with all pieces of artistic writing, or character-based narratives, it's always going to be a reflection of its time and the audiences that existed when it was written. It just is. Citizen Kane is a reflection of the time that that film was created, and as a result, watching it now is a little bit more difficult for mainstream audiences compared to when it was initially released. It's the same reason why people say that that book or that film or that TV show or whatever hasn't aged well simply because of the general mores or attitudes or expectations of the audiences that will consume that particular product, those can change and they can change pretty drastically and very quickly. I mean, look at Duke Nukem. Duke Nukem was super popular for a while and now those games just couldn't be made today. It's one of those same ex expectations when people ask if you could make another bully game, for instance, from Rockstar and have it work the same way as it did when it launched. Don't worry, I'm actually making a video on that very topic discussing that very question. So if you want to see it, make sure to subscribe. 
But setting all of that aside, what we do know is that Corey Barlog discussed at length in most recently Raising Kratos, the documentary made on the creation of this game, he discussed all of the things that he sought in rebooting the franchise. It wasn't a restarting, it wasn't a, a uh, remaster, it wasn't going to be redoing anything, it was going to be a continuation of the core story, but it was going to be a reboot in terms of attitude and approach. Now, Corey Barlog said that he knew he wanted to create a deeper story and that he wanted to shift the character over the shoulder and also focus on a simple story with complex characters. And I have to say, the game does achieve this. The story is very simple. Kratos and his son are simply trying to get ashes to the top of a mountain. It's fairly straightforward. Of course, there's some road bumps here and there, but that's effectively what they're trying to do. And during the course of this, Kratos and Atreus learn to be a family again after the death of his wife, Faye, while they carry her ashes to the top of this tallest mountain. And one of my major concerns going into the game was that they weren't going to be able to capture all of the complexities of Kratos while also making it a God of War game, because in the past, God of War has always been about gore, more fighting, more gore, more blood, more fighting, more anger, more rage, more hatred, all of these things, which were directly antithetical, at least at the outset, to what they wanted to achieve with this most recent game. Don't get me wrong, you can have a very complex character who is filled with hate and does terrible things. You can absolutely have that in any story, but it's important to understand why those characters are doing the things that they're doing. And it's far more interesting to have a character with a bunch of vices that's struggling to keep those vices in check and only use them in particular instances, which is something that we're going to see time and time again as we continue to discuss this most recent game. Now let's talk about our first look at Kratos after all these years away from him. On the title screen, he's standing over a tree with a glowing handprint on it. And this handprint turns out to be the last mark that exists of of Faye, his wife, and the mother of his son. We also see a large scar across Kratos' abdomen that wasn't there before, and that's because it's a scar from when he stabbed himself on the top of Mount Olympus with the blade of Olympus to release hope into the world. Now just this title screen is significant because it shows the application of Kratos' forgiveness of himself. He has moved on to the point where he's actually able to remarry and love another, which is a major step for Kratos. Sure, in God of War 3, he had technically accepted his actions and the fact that he had killed and was responsible for the death of his family, but he certainly wasn't at the point where he was ready to settle down with a new wife and have a kid. Now, in any narrative, whether it's a play, a movie, a musical, a novel, or a video game, regardless of what it is, it's important to keep perspective. If a writer is doing their job properly, a character is not going to come off as a monolith. Instead, they're going to come off as deep and complex characters who have conflicting motivations and are struggling to find their way through life. The second their motivations and their considerations become one-dimensional, the character loses all depth and interest. So, if we replace Kratos with literally anybody else, think about your dad or your brother or your sister or anybody that you know imagine that they are responsible for the death of their loved one their spouse and child for them to move on and reach the point of acceptance to the point where they can marry again and have another child is a pretty gigantic step for them it's the next phase of life it's huge and so just because kratos was born a demigod and has all these special strength abilities and powers doesn't mean that he's any less vulnerable to these weaknesses like you or me maybe in games past he was but this time around it's different furthermore he has to cut this tree down which is significant because we just found out that kratos was able to move on from his past actions except that he was ready to have a new wife a new love again and another child and instead of starting the game with that knowledge, instead of starting the game showing us Faye, showing us the birth of Atreus and a happy family, we start with Kratos in mourning. Now, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out why they chose to do this, because it does seem like that would have been the obvious choice, to show Kratos when he was happy and satisfied, to show the family when it was put together, like in a horror movie. You start with everything happy and great, and then you show it all collapse and fall down around them. And what I realized is that I don't think Kratos can exist in a happy-go-lucky world. I don't think Kratos is Kratos if he's satisfied in life. I think he has to be struggling. He is a character who, in and of himself, is conflicted and always suffering to some extent. And the moment that he's not suffering, he's not 
Kratos anymore. He's still somebody we can love and respect as a character, but he's not Kratos. Now, I expect that opinion to get a fair bit of heat, so I want to hear your thoughts on it down below, whether you agree or disagree. I want to hear your justification, because to me, once again, it seems like it would have been the easier choice to show us Faye, to introduce us to that relationship, show that Kratos has moved on, and then have that ripped away. I mean, again, I think a lesser writer probably would have shown us with a happy family uh, with Atreus and his mother and then shown uh, Balder ripping them away or killing Faye in the process or something. But instead, we skip right past it and we never see Faye. We never meet her. We never do anything with her. It's always in our imagination. And I would say furthermore that the way that any story or video game or novel, any narrative really starts is incredibly important, such as in Red Dead Redemption 2, the fact that they don't start the story in Blackwater, but actually right after it while they're on the run is very intentional. And with The Witcher 3, we start the game with Geralt having a dream which shows his deep held anxieties. All of that's very intentional and frames the characters and the world specifically and carefully if it's done properly. And if you want to hear my thoughts on those at length, links to the, both of the critiques that I did on those down in the description box below. I'm warning you, they're long, but if you're this far in the video already, you're probably able to handle it. Now, if we talk a little bit about this in between time, what we know about Kratos and what went on between the end of God of War 3 and the beginning of this most recent game, we have a little bit of knowledge, but a lot of it is left up to the interpretation and imaginations of the viewers. What we know is that Kratos went off to live in the Norse realm after Greece was destroyed, likely to run away from his past and everything that he had done to get a fresh start effectively. Kratos eventually met Faye and they had Atreus soon after. Now, Kratos would spend large swaths of time in the forest trying to control his rage. And this is the explanation as to why Kratos was rarely present while Atreus was being raised. The one thing with this is that Kratos must have been outside constantly. I mean, really, how many fights can he pick? I, I guess it makes sense. All he knows is fighting and he was probably running around hunting deer, collecting food for the family. But really, they talk about Kratos as though he was never home. He was never doing anything. So perhaps Kratos was simply not home and was traveling through the realm. But that also doesn't make a lot of sense because Kratos says many times that they didn't leave this little encampment. They stayed put and he tried to live a simple life. So it's, again, not really clear what Kratos was doing. Furthermore, what we know is that it took him years to learn how to control his anger and rage, at least to the extent that he can when the game begins. However, it still seeps up. But again, I will just stress that this wasn't a six month process or a small foray into the woods for Kratos. Christopher Judge, the actor behind Kratos, who, as we would expect, probably had a lot of behind the scenes information on Kratos and his motivations and what was going on by Corey Barlog, the game's writer. He said that Kratos effectively missed 10 years of Atreus's early life. You know, as a, as a father of four children, it's uh, interesting that uh, you know, this, this has been a, a man who has missed 10 years uh, of, of his child growing up. And uh, I, I really found uh, some, some parallels with my own life there um, because I was working on a show and I basically missed 10 years of my kids growing up. So it's, it's just uh, it's an interesting dynamic for me. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, clo a little closer to home than, I, than I'd like it to be. <laughs> a, a lot of this performance, for me, is a love letter to my kids. It's, and, and, it's, and it's an apology. And that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> now let's talk about the rage for a moment. This represents across the board Kratos's old life. And this is why he panics when he sees Atreus beginning to exhibit the same characteristics. 
And this is also why Kratos wanted to name him Atreus, which was the same name as that young soldier I told you about earlier, who was always optimistic and able to see the light through the darkness. This is the man he wanted Atreus, his son, to be, and so he named him after the most optimistic and positive person that he had ever encountered. This also can explain a lot of the time that Kratos didn't spend with his family while Atreus was growing up. Simply, he was afraid that he would do to them what he had done to his last family if he were to lose his temper. He straight up doesn't trust himself. And this insecurity I find absolutely beautiful, especially considering the fact that Kratos is such an overwhelmingly strong and powerful looking individual. The fact that he's so strong but still has a weak mind and spirit is a perfect contrast and leads to a lot of really interesting character beats. Now, Faye, Kratos' wife, understood this and respected it, but Atreus thought it meant that Kratos straight up didn't love him or Faye, which is understandable for a child and is reflected a lot in real world relationships. Not to mention that this would be really hard to explain to your son. Like, listen, I know you're upset that your dad isn't here a lot, and I know you're upset that he's always gone, and you think that that means he doesn't love you. He does love you. He's just worried he's gonna murder you and your mommy if he's around us because he did that to his last family. <laughs> like, it, it, would be, it would be hard to explain that to a little kid, and so I completely understand why Instead, Faye just chose never to talk about it, and uh, it is uh, a tough situation, I will say that. But one thing that's made very clear is that Faye was well aware of all of these difficulties that Atreus and Kratos were going to be encountering once she was gone, and as a result, she set up this whole quest for them to go on to learn how to be father and son and a family without her. Now this rage is a major theme throughout the newest game. Seriously, it's in many of the key scenes throughout the game's narrative, the key pivotal moments. It defines the character's motivations and what they're doing. As I said earlier, when Kratos sees Atreus raging, he becomes panicked because he sees a reflection of himself in Atreus once again. And again, this is a reflection also of the gods to man that we were talking about earlier, where God sees man and man sees God in themselves. And even during the biggest rage that Atreus experiences, we can even see the flames rise just like with Kratos, and they remain until Kratos picks up and holds Atreus, at which point the flames disperse. And this is also what terrifies Kratos, the fact that some of the problems he faces in the story of the game can't be punched through. Because after all, for most of his life, Kratos has been able to brute force his way through the difficulties that he's faced. I mean, look at the fight with Baldur in the beginning of the game. The only way that he's able to defeat this beast is by losing himself to the rage. But guess what? He can't do that with his family. And the clearest example is when Kratos has to bring Atreus to Freya after he collapses. He has to stand holding Atreus, doing nothing while waiting for the elevator to reach the top, which is what Cory Barlog described as a lion in the cage moment. He wanted Kratos to feel as though he were a lion trapped in a small cage with all of this power and anger and force behind him, but being utterly incapable of exacting it or using it to better his current position. And this moment of helplessness happens to everyone in varying degrees. I mean, think of that first month that you weren't going to be able to make rent. You were really worried that you weren't going to be able to scrap together enough cash to pay your landlord. You had worked your butt off all month, but your bills were just too big. Your pride likely prevented you from talking about it and from being honest with what was happening. It might have even gotten so bad that you couldn't pay for gas to drive to work, and so you had to make up some excuse as to why you were walking or biking. Saying some crap like, I like biking, which, let's be honest, nobody does. It's truly humbling, and it helps you grow, and this is Kratos's I can't pay the rent moment. He can't do anything about it. He has to put his faith and trust in other people. And it should also be said that this rage that Atreus experiences is nobody's fault but his. He is the one who created Atreus and gave him this curse. Furthermore, Kratos throughout the entire game doesn't want to explain to Atreus his lineage. He doesn't want to tell him about the fact that Kratos is a demigod and that in turn makes Atreus a demigod. He's terrified of the truth because he's afraid that if he tells Atreus the truth, Atreus will either lose respect for him or he will realize his true power and potential and will turn into a mini Kratos, something he 
does not want to happen. And this is similar to what happened back when his family died in Greece. Sure, it was his fault, after all, he killed them, but he was able to still pass off a lot of the blame to Ares and the gods of Olympus in general for clouding his vision and corrupting his mind. But here, it's very intentional that there is no one left to blame. It's all Kratos, and Kratos is helpless to it. And this is even reflected in the gameplay of God of War, where after this major story beat, you are left to go and deal with this problem yourself without Atreus, who you've been playing with for hours and hours and hours at this point. And if the game has done its job properly, Kratos should feel naked without Atreus. It should feel wrong and empty because after all, you become so accustomed to going through this world with your son that now you're without him, it feels wrong. And this has been done many times in video games, leaving the player feeling helpless by way of gameplay empathy, as I call it. Basically, you're putting the player in the same shoes as the player character to make them feel the same way. For instance, when you play as Ellie in The Last of Us, you don't know if Joel is dead or if he's just sick, but the player is forced into the same shoes as Ellie. You feel much less powerful without Joel and his rough and tumble survival experience. It makes you feel the same way as the character. Now we come into the last phase of this discussion, which is the idea of growth within the story of God of War, which is, at its core, the point of everything. Kratos goes from being a man broken and struggling to a man that's fulfilled and motivated. Fulfilled in the knowledge that he has achieved that which his wife, Faye, asked him to do, which is to take her ashes to the tallest peak in the Nine Realms, and in doing so, learning how to be the father that Atreus deserves and needs. But even more specifically, one of the major shifts in the game story is something that many players didn't see coming whatsoever, which is the giant Blades of Chaos reveal. Now, this reveal is something that they discuss at length during the documentary Raising Kratos. Christopher Judge, the actor behind Kratos, goes into depth with it, saying that in order to get into the proper mental space to play this scene the way that they felt they should, he needed to go into a really dark, dark place. I'll, I'll play a couple clips for you. You know, I, I think as an actor, you always want to feel safe. You always want to, because when you when you do choose to do that, you can't bring yourself out of it. It takes some decompression. The scene when I go back and get the Blades of Chaos. It was probably not, not real early on, but early on in the filming. And that's kind of what I was like, do I want to go there? Because this, this was a moment. If, if I was going to take the scab off it as a person, as a human being, this is where it is. There's nowhere you can hide, Spartan. Put as much distance between you and the truth as you want. It changes nothing. Pretend to be everything you are not. Teacher. Husband. Father, but there is one unavoidable truth you will never escape. <laughs> you cannot change. You will always be a monster. I know. This vulnerability is something that you probably wouldn't see coming from Kratos if you had just played the first games and had no expectation of what this God of War was going to offer. In simply pulling a package out from underneath the floorboards and wrapping the chains around his arms, we see that he's calling back to his first family, to all of the evils that he's committed and the pain that he's caused, both for himself and many other people around him who he cared for 
very deeply. The way that they handled this scene was absolutely beautiful, and the fact that there isn't a whole lot of dialogue, the fact that Athena reappears, the fact that everything lines up so perfectly, I think is pretty incredible. Now I've got some smaller problems with how these beats were set up and how they were framed. For instance, I think that Atreus wasn't useful enough in combat, at least on the lower difficulty levels leading up to this moment, so that when you reach this point where you're using the Blades of Chaos, they don't feel as though you've just gained access to a really dark and evil power that you shouldn't have access to, um, or that you're sacrificing part of your humanity in order to achieve that. Instead, it just feels like a new fun tool. On the harder difficulties, the game is experienced the way I believe they wanted you to experience it, which is that you feel naked and, and alone without Atreus. You feel as though you're missing a part of yourself. And then you put on the Blades of Chaos and it's just different and weird and crazy. Once again, I think it, it reflects the idea that higher difficulties often can reflect a more genuine experience in terms of what the designer was going for, but I think that that's a discussion for another video. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is the revelation at the very end of the game where they talk about Atreus being Loki and this seemingly coming out of nowhere and left field and the fact that this is going to set up all of the sequels and everything that they're doing where Loki is going to usher in the end of the world, Ragnarok effectively. So with me at least when I encountered this moment in the story it seemed very ham-fisted like okay they're just throwing out that he's Loki okay well that changes a lot of the stuff that we just set up and it, it seemed as though it was a plot twist that they threw in at the very end of the game's writing just because they realized they could and it could be kind of fun and this is even reflected with Corey Barlog in a couple of interviews where he says that that wasn't an idea from the beginning. It was something that some of the other writers came up with and threw out as a possibility. I really wish we could say that from the beginning that was the plan, uh, but it was not. Uh, Matt Sophos and, and Rich Gobert, the two writers that I'm working with on this, brilliant writers that wrote Lost Planet 3, absolutely underrated, underrated story in that game. It's so freaking good. But uh, they had come into my office one day and said they had an idea and uh, they wanted to pitch it. I was like, all right, cool. And their pitch was verbatim the lines that were used in the game. That's how solid it was. You know, it's like, yeah, they, they, you know, be recounting the story of looking at the mural and say, uh, he understands all of this stuff. He said, but what was weird is he didn't understand they kept getting his name wrong in the mural. They kept calling him Loki. And he even said it the way that Sonny ends up saying it, Loki. And I was just like, oh. You guys suck. I wish I came up with that idea. It's so good. I'm totally going to take credit for that. Now, I'd like to talk about it at length and say one way or the other what this means for the story and what this means for the characters, but I honestly don't know, and I honestly don't think that the writers do either. Like I said, this seemed to have been something that they kind of threw together at the last minute. They put on a giant mural with some pictures of Atreus holding Kratos seemingly mortally injured or dead it's not really clear so they're making some sort of prediction but whether or not that's an actual prediction of where the franchise is going or how this particular trilogy is going to end i don't know and i don't know if they know they could always just spin this as that's your destiny but you can rewrite it if you do this thing instead so we'll just have to see but i think in general god of war the most recent one did something very interesting and that is that it humanized and grounded a character who previously was just a rage machine, which is pretty fantastic, and it's something that I think was desperately needed. I at least felt that Kratos was starting to become very stagnant and that he wasn't progressing as a character, that it felt as though we had seen everything we needed to see with Kratos and there was nowhere else to go. And they did reboot it. They gave him a new family, they gave him a new start, they put him in a new world, and it actually worked and as you see even in this last scene Kratos is actually touching his son he's being familial he's being kind he's being loving and that's something that we certainly didn't see at the beginning of the game it would have been very hard to see or believe as happening even at the end of God of War 3. Kratos is a fascinating character and he's a character that's received a lot more depth in the recent versions of his story that we've received and the additions to it as well. I'm very excited to see where the writers take him in the next few games that we get, probably at least two, because my guess is they're going to do a Norse trilogy, just like the original trilogy, and then they'll move on to ancient Egyptian lore or something 
towards the end of next generation. But that pretty much does it from me. I want to hear your thoughts on all this down in the comment section below. As I said, I probably skipped over a couple beats that you thought were really important. I want to hear what those were down in the comment section below. Uh, it helps generate a discussion. Everybody can put their thoughts down there. It turns into something really cool really quickly. So I want to hear all of those down below. If you like the video, make sure to like it. If you have a character you want me to cover in an upcoming video, make sure to leave that down below as well. You guys choose the characters. I just do a lot of research on them and break them down for you. But that's all for me. Thank you for watching. I love you all, and I'll see you in the next video.